Nature and pharmaceutical medicine are more intertwined than you might think. There is an entire field of study which is devoted to the discovery of drugs from plants or other naturally occurring substances called pharmacognosy. To my naturalist, this may sound ideal, but from the perspective of the Pacific yew tree found naturally to contain one of today's most common chemotherapy drugs, Taxol, it was a death sentence. After all, there may be precedent for a plant harvested to extinction for its medical gifts, and it may be related to the cardioid, the shape that we all refer to as a heart and use as a symbol for love, despite only having the faintest resemblance to an actual heart. One hypothesis of the origin of the cardioid is the ancient Greek city of Cyrene, who made their fortune harvesting and trading in silphium. They struck their coins with depictions of the seeds and stalks of the silphium plant and even had a coin of a woman pointing at a silphium stalk with one hand and her genitals with her other hand. Because among its other uses, silphium was an ancient form of contraception believed to both prevent and terminate pregnancy. Nothing says I love you more than the gift of consequence-free copulation. But how well did this ancient birth control work? Modern science will never get to test it because it was harvested to extinction and the rich city of Cyrene is no more. Hi, I'm Carter, an MD-PhD student. I make videos on skincare, health, and medicine. Subscribe if you have a body. Moving on from ancient history, plenty of the drugs we use every day are compounds derived from plants. One notable example is aspirin, or acetylsalicylic acid, derived from salicin, a chemical found in the common willow. While there are articles ascribing the discovery of salicin to civilizations from the Assyrians to the ancient Greeks to Native Americans, there is little evidence that these preparations use salicin at doses that would have been effective. And it's a good thing too, because doses of willow extract containing enough salicin to affect fever and pain would also cause gastrointestinal side effects like bloody vomiting. In fact, the only time Hippocrates, who is often cited as the OG aspirin doctor mentioned in many articles for using aspirin to treat fever, mentioned willow directly in his own writing, it wasn't for reducing pain or fever like we use aspirin for today. In fact, he believed that fever was beneficial for fighting off an infection and didn't put a lot of effort into reducing it. His use of willow was much more interesting. He recommended burning the willow leaves, creating smoke to fumigate the uterus to get rid of the remnants of a miscarriage, much like this picture. It's really only in modern times that we've been able to take complete advantage of what nature has to offer. In the case of aspirin, we were able to produce a high purity salicylic acid and acetylate it to create a tolerable side effect profile. A similar process was used to create many other drugs with 50% of drugs brought to market between 1981 and 2006 being discovered in nature or synthesized from compounds found in nature. The ubiquitous diabetes drug metformin was derived from French lilac, opium, hydrocodone, and other painkillers from poppies, and the malaria drug and tonic flavoring quinine from the bark of the cinchona tree. And of course, the chemotherapy drug Taxol from the Pacific U. The history of Taxol begins with the Harvard-trained USDA biologist, Arthur Barclay, who in 1962 took a sample of bark from the Pacific U tree, Taxus brevifolia, in the forest near Packwood, Washington, in the Northwest United States, as part of a National Cancer Institute screening program, which collected samples from over 1,000 plant species that were tested in vitro, meaning on cells in a dish, before moving on to animal and human trials. Barclay had no reason to believe this particular species contained one of the most influential cancer drugs of all time. He was just collecting plant species at random, and this was his 1,654 plant sample he collected. The Pacific yew grows slowly under the shade of larger trees, and the thin trunks aren't good for making housing or furniture, although yew species have been used for making spears and bows. And critically for this study, the Pacific yew is immune to most pests because of the chemicals it produces. Arthur's 1,654th sample was sent to the Wisconsin Alumni Foundation, where it showed promise in a cancer assay, prompting Arthur Barclay to return to the same tree and take 30 more pounds of bark from the thin, ancient, slow-growing plant. The bark was sent to Dr. Monroe Wall, who previously led a project to extract plant steroids and turn them into the anti-inflammatory drug cortisone, and his junior, Dr. Wani, at the National Products Laboratory of the Research Triangle Institute. This is not a stock image, this is an actual photo of Wall and Wani. Anyway, in the small and strange world of plant chemistry, Wall was known as a fractionator, or someone who took the chaos of natural life in all its complexity and found the part or fraction that contained the desired effect. Together, they crystallized the pure and active chemical from Arthur's bark and found that in their assays, it killed cancer cells better than healthy cells. And better yet, 
its activity against cancer was broad, killing a type of mouse leukemia in a dish that none of the other candidates could touch. Just like aspirin from the willow, a natural plant compound, now called Taxol, became a hot pharmaceutical candidate. However, it was not known how many Pacific yew trees were in the wild, and it required over 50 pounds of bark to make a single gram of Taxol. But Taxol showed incredible promise as a skin cancer drug, so Wall and Wani placed an order for 375 pounds of additional bark, and the work continued. In 1971, after three years of research, the structure of Taxol was found, and it excited and terrified Taxol researchers. The molecule was strange, complex, and unlike anything synthetic chemists had on their shelves. In 1977, Matthew Suffness of the National Cancer Institute approved Taxol for formulation into a drug for animal trials. In preparation, he placed an order for 7,000 pounds of bark, which he realized meant snuffing out 1,500 of the uncommon tree. And since the Pacific yew doesn't grow in homogeneous groups, but scattered throughout the virgin forest, the whole ecosystem would be threatened by the hunt for Pacific yew bark. Environmentalists took notice, and in the same year that Suffness placed his 7,000 pound bark order, the Save the Yew Foundation was formed to lobby the government to put an end to the coming genocide before it began. Meanwhile, the thirst for Taxus brevifolia bark only increased when Susan Horowitz at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, a school I interviewed for medical school at, discovered that Taxol killed cancer in a way that was previously unknown to science. Furthermore, Taxol was succeeding beyond anyone's estimation in ovarian cancer trials, and the National Cancer Institute was receiving 60,000 pound shipments of Pacific yew bark to keep up with the demand. At a cost of $1.5 million per shipment, each order yielded just three measly ounces of Taxol for use in these trials. But Suffness became concerned. If Taxol were used to treat just the patients with ovarian cancer right now, it would require 240 pounds of Taxol, and cost the lives of 360,000 slow-growing Pacific yew trees, trading the lives of about six trees, each hundreds of years old, to give just one human a fighting chance at beating cancer. Due to its slow growth, cultivation wasn't an option, so despite the complexity of Taxol's structure, Suffness and the full force of NCI funding rallied the world's best scientists to find a way to make Taxol that didn't require the elimination of the Pacific yew. The tension subsided slightly when the French scientist Pierre Potier found a similar molecule in a related European tree that grows in abundance. While the tree didn't produce Taxol itself, Potier and friends were able to use chemical modifications to create Taxol. And better yet, although the yields were low, the chemical could be extracted from the leaves of the tree, allowing for a sustainable harvest. Continuation of this work led to a commercially viable semi-synthetic method to get the Taxol we needed for clinical trials and early days of release. And thus, Taxol was approved by the FDA in 1992 after very impressive results in breast cancer trials. However, during the clinical trials that led to the FDA approval, Suffness knew that Taxol was going to be a hit drug, and Potier's method wasn't going to produce nearly enough of it for the waves of cancer patients to come. So Suffness pushed relentlessly, administering grants and harassing synthetic chemists to take up the call to arms until, finally, on December 9, 1993, Bob Holton completed a scalable and economically viable synthesis of Taxol, ending the decades-long journey from plant to medicine. Just two years later, Suffness passed away, leaving the world with both Taxol and the Pacific U still in it. For his work, the Matt Suffness Memorial U Grove was dedicated in his honor. But what if a sustainable way to produce Taxol hadn't been found? Would doctors have prescribed it, knowing that every dose brought the Pacific U closer to extinction? Would the environmentalists have been able to stop the production of Taxol when human lives were on the line? Would Taxol and the Pacific U have been lost to humankind, just like the ancient Silphium seeds? We will never know. And if you'd like to support the channel, I put links to some of my favorite skincare and health products in the description. And if you want more content about skincare, health, and interesting stories in medicine, click the subscribe button. And if you have any comments, leave them in the peer review section down below. Thanks for watching.